Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Hello and welcome to episode 39. Today we're delighted to welcome to the podcast Jonathan Cranfield to talk about the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. Jonathan is a lecturer in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Liverpool John Moores University in the United Kingdom, where he teaches courses on Victorian realism, science and sensation, and on Gothic fiction. In 2016, he authored 20th Century Victorian, Arthur Conan Doyle and the Strand magazine, an in-depth study of the symbiotic relationship between writer and publication. And he's on the editorial board of the Edinburgh edition of the works of Arthur Conan Doyle, and has just edited the Edinburgh Works edition of Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, which is our topic today. So Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Hello, Jonathan. Um, First question, how did you come to be interested in Conan Doyle? uh, And was he always the focus of your research? Yeah, I think he's always been there at the centre. Um, if I was going to trace my my the, the tale of my own personal nerddom <laughs> all the way back, I'd probably go. I remember having some of the old Puffin illustrated Sherlock Holmes when I was a when I was a young boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the uh, mm-hmm. sort of the the fond de classics like Dracula and Jekyll and Hyde and Sherlock Holmes, and then um, it sort of uh, as an adult, I guess it got activated primarily by the Jeremy Brett television mm-hmm. adaptations so i don't know if that's a, a sort of a non-scholarly admission but <laughs> i remember, went to my friend's house and he had the dvd box set and i was uh and we we stayed up for i think about uh 12 hours watching various mm-hmm. cherry-picked episodes and i think i remember the dying detective and various other uh, various other episodes that are really sticking in my mind and i think jeremy brett's performance really sort of uh, refigured my relationship with the character and then mm. um as a as a, as an MA student, I did a course on Victorian literature, which was run by a, a, a great professor of Victorian literature called Rod Edmund, who did a famous book called um, Leprosy and Empire, which had a, a long section in it about uh, the blanched soldier. And uh, I had to do a presentation on that. And so in preparing for that, I think I prepared something like 30 or 40 pages worth of uh, for a presentation that should have lasted about 10 minutes. <laughs> And from that point on, I think the uh, the die was cast that whatever else I might explore, Conan Doyle was always going to be there at the centre of my of my scholarship and my my work. Mm-hmm. Fantastic! And you wrote this wonderful book I mentioned in the introduction there, the twentieth uh, uh, century Victorian. And um, uh, in that book, you chart that relationship between writer and publication right through from the origins through to ultimately Conan Doyle's death. And in that, you make the point that. Conan Doyle's appeal, about his appeal really to that middle brow reading public. I mean, was he just right place, right time? Or was there sort of more to to his success, do you think? I think he definitely was right place, right time. Um, but then he was also helping to create the time as well, mm. at, at the same time as being there. So I think it's important to understand that um, the way the whole print and periodical marketplace had been sort of endlessly revolutionized from the 1860s onwards really in order to serve that demographic that we, we would call the sort of the middle brow yeah um so i, I don't want to get i don't want to get into too too much tedious uh, legalese uh, but for many many years the the british government had viewed periodical publishing as a kind of a, as a potential threat for the spread of 
radical and seditious thought ever since mm. the, the uh, Napoleonic Wars. And so there were very heavy taxes and levies and stamp duties payable on the importation of paper and the publishing of magazines and newspapers. Um, but by the time we get to the 1860s, uh, those are starting to relax. Conan Doyle, of course, born just before then. So mm-hmm. uh, this sort of mirrors the, the, the development of his own life. Uh, so by the time you have... Uh, but when we get to the 1880s, you start getting the illustrated magazines, and those start to be where, when he first starts writing, he places his his early stories. Um, and sometimes he aspires higher, so he often sends things to magazines like <laughs> Cornhill, mm-hmm. uh, which is edited, obviously edited in the 1850s and 60s by his family friend, uh, William Makepeace Thackeray. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when he aspires high, he sends them there, and then he goes down the periodical food chain <laughs> uh, as the stories get rejected, and he might end up, you know, in Boy's Own or <laughs> something like that uh, if things get rejected over and over again. Um, and so, I mean, really, my sense of his career is really as someone who, first of all, is shaped by by that landscape. Mm. Um, he has very high ambitions by his own light. So his his ideal is his highest aesthetic achievement in his own mind is the historical novel, mm. um, which I think looking back seems a little bit anomalous now. Um, yeah. the, the benefits and the virtues of the historical novel have probably haven't outlasted the period where Conan Doyle believed that. Mm, um, that's true. Yeah. And he discovered that there was a market for short stories um, and short stories that very quickly were congealing around certain genres and gener- sets of generic expectations and actually his great skill um, over and above whatever other virtues he may have was that he was able to target his fiction uh, appropriately for different audiences mm. and so that malleability uh, the ability to shape his fiction in that way probably what uh, fixed him to be in that position when the Strand magazine started um, when it did um, in 1891. Um, so he was definitely in the right place in the right time, but he had made himself into the right man for the right place <laughs> and the right time, just at that precipitous and, uh, just at that precipitous moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. I, I, I always, we, we've, we've come back to this theme time and again, that Conan Doyle is a great synthesizer and sort of summarizer of, of trends and where things where things happen he just and and you know even if you look at this sort of detective fiction as we're going to be looking at today he's perhaps not a sort of pure innovator but a great it's evolutionary rather than revolutionary but there does seem to be something about being able to talk to that particular audience as you're saying there at the end there about being able to target to to a particular readership at a particular time yeah definitely and i think um, there's always the question that comes up around the Strand magazine because it, it dominates so much discussion or at least academic discussion about you know, the short story as a form and mm. how English writers uh, were, were pretty slow to take it up in comparison, say, to European writers and American writers. Um, and there's a story there that's, I think, partly to do with um, the commercial possibilities of the genre. So if you're a French writer, if you're Maupassant, uh, <laughs> then you can find a very wide readership writing uh, short stories, but really in Britain, it's looked down upon. Mm. Um, it doesn't make a tremendous amount of money, even though you can find mm. writers like Mary Shelley um, spending really the second part of her career writing mm. writing short fiction um, for the periodicals. It's uh, it's very lower down on the food chain, without much aesthetic um, <laughs> value in people's minds. Um, but gradually that changes, and I think one of the reasons that changes for British authors is that the financial incentives are there once the periodical marketplace develops and you have all these magazines that are desperate, soon desperate to publish British short fiction. And so you get that great flowering of British writers um, starting really, starting really with Stevenson and Mm. L.T. Mead, uh, but also I think predominantly including Wells and Doyle um, who are are lifted up to become professional writers because they work in that medium and can earn money quickly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good point. Good point. And it's tying in with that, Jonathan, is, is this, this idea where you talk about right place, right man, <clears throat> and also right character. With, 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 with Sherlock Holmes, he just hits the bullseye. Uh, and so we, 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 once we've got Scandal in Bohemia, it, it really just takes off with, with this character. And so you run from Scandal in Bohemia, 12 stories through to the Copper Beaches. Then a bit of a brief break for, of a few months, and then we've got um, Silver Blaze. Uh, and you point out that that Silver Blaze is is number thirteen. That what we know as the memoirs 
is at the time in the Strand seen as a continuation, essentially, of the adventures. What leaped out to you when considering this set, i.e. the memoirs, as an entity in their own right, in the way that we read them, as compared to the way the Strand readers would have read originally? Uh, I think that's a really good question. I think I found myself getting pulled in two directions, really. The first was I was surprised when I returned to the stories. I'd read them in the Strand before, but mm. when you return and you realise that Silver Blaze is called, uh, that in the heading of it, it says, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, number 13. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and you mm. realise, oh, I see this really was intended to just be read by the readers as a straight and continuous feed immediately from Copper Beaches into into Silver Blaze and the new sequence. Mm. And I suppose I was surprised then to discover uh, via Lancelin Green's book, The Uncollected Sherlock Holmes, mm. that really the whole idea of the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes was really a post hoc invention purely yeah. for the book mm. for the book edition, um, which was to come out in uh, December 1893. Uh, so that in one instance, I had to start having to think about them, I guess, as a, as a composite whole more than I had done before. Mm. But at the same time, when you go through Conan Doyle's notes and you go through his letters from the period where he's composing, even really the, the second part of the adventure sequence, he in himself breaks them down into these small sequences of novels and he writes them in short batches. And so mm. the last cluster of adventures stories he refers to them in his letters as a series unto themselves so he doesn't think of them as yeah of course the second part of the adventures um and that's related i think to hit the the attitude that he has uh, as a professional writer i guess he's sort of preparing his wares for market and <laughs> that kind of thing uh, but it's also i think related to the to the increasing difficulty and the inc uh, sort of the decrease of satisfaction that he got from writing them mm. um, that they became increasingly workmanlike productions at least in his own at least in his own mind mm. so i suppose i was pulled in all these different directions because obviously the strand wants you to think about them as one complete sequence but conan doyle himself is actually working in a in a more uh working in a more granular way mm. and uh in the end you get this construct of the memoirs and i've always thought of them as the memoirs but of mm. course mm. that was really just something that just f flitted into conan doyle's head mm. in about <laughs> november <laughs> when george mm. noons needed a title for the book galleys so yes yeah <laughs> And and one of the things I thought you you brought out really well in your introduction to this new edition is this point that um, you know Conan Doyle's life has changed quite remarkably in that period in that sort of six month hiatus for the reading public between the adventures and the memoirs as we know them now his life has changed you know sort of quite radically uh, and that you you pick up that you know that there are themes in the memoirs which sort of reflect. Conan Doyle's changing personal circumstances. So, you know, tell us a bit more about about that. Yeah, well, I think if you take it from um, really from the middle of the adventures sequence, his life changes really beyond all recognition. Yeah, because when the first advent stories of the adventures appear, you know, he's working as an ophthalmologist in London very unsuccessfully. Um, he's living in London in what's you know, really temporary accommodation with his wife and his family. It's not very appropriate. And then as soon as the adventures hits and he realises he's going to be able to rely on a reasonable income, he immediately abandons uh, really his entire medical career yes. in a couple of weeks, um, packs up shop, sells his instruments. It's yeah. not accidental, I think, that in uh, the, the plot of Silver Blaze uh, turns on the... Um, the small ophthalmological mm. instrument yes, of course. Um, that the groom uses. And those were precisely the instruments that Conan Doyle had sold um, uh, as he as he packed up his medical practice. Um, so he gives all that up. His motivating ambition for the preceding two decades through his years at university and through his hard years as a GP, grinding out a living, working as a, as a general practitioner in, in South Sea, all of that just goes instantly. And suddenly he's able to live this professional life that he's always that he's always dreamed of Move, moves his family out to the suburbs he's able to commute into london he's able to socialize with uh, other writers of note he has money that he can make private investments mm -hmm. and it's not accidental i think that various of the memoirs plots turn on uh, investments that may mm -hmm. or may not be wise and on stock prices <laughs> <laughs> good point <laughs> Um, but that's obviously something really only that you can do when you're in a position of uh, of affluence, which Conan Doyle is. 
um, I think elsewhere you look at his family life, and I say obviously he moved with his uh, with his wife and his family out to the suburbs, but then he's also able to recall his sisters, who uh, three of them were working as governesses in Portugal. Um, and to some extent or another, uh, accounts vary. They had been their wages had been subsidising both Conan Doyle's education, his life, and also the education of of his brother mm. Inez. Um, and so that imbalance always rankled with Conan Doyle, I think, a little bit, because obviously being mm. a governess, you know, you don't really need to go too far into the biographies of the Brontes to discover what a demanding and hard job uh, being a governess is. And he was acutely conscious of this. Not only that, his eldest sister passed away just on the brink of his uh, of the adventures becoming successful. So um, the fact that he was able to recall them, the fact that he was able to invite his mother to come and live with him, mm. uh, which she absolutely steadfastly refused yes. to do <laughs> throughout her entire life uh, for reasons which we might like to speculate upon. I mm. don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, but yes, because she, she's obviously very well settled, living on the margins of the estate of her former what, what would you lodger. call that, someone who rents a lodger. House? lodger? There you go. <laughs> former lodger, yeah. <laughs> yeah, her former quote unquote lodger, Brian Charles Waller, who has um, <laughs> inherited the family estate on the, in Yorkshire. And so Conan Doyle's mother, whatever relationship there was between the, Conan Doyle's mother and Brian Charles Waller, he is, he is married mm-hmm. um, when, he, when he assumes, uh, when he assumes his, his inheritance. But um, yes, his mother is very keen to stay there and, and not relocate, which might seem surprising given how close Conan Doyle and his mother were. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Suffice to say, this period of, I mean, just to sort of tidy up the family dimension of this, um, the period between 1892 and 1893 also marks the deaths of a couple of Conan Doyle's uh, uncles. He referred to them as his mm. London uncles. This is part of the Catholic branch of his father's family, all of whom were pretty well connected gallery managers, um, cartoonists, uh, writers, academicians. Um, whose patronage and support Conan Doyle had always refused to um, capitalise upon because of his religious beliefs. Um, They died, and then, of course, just before you get to the end of 1893, his father passes away as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that that whole period, really, from the middle of the adventures to the end of the publication of the memoirs, is really a period of of great and profound turbulence in his life. I mean, really the end of his his early adulthood, I would say, Um, and all of those sort of landmarks that go along with it. Yeah, yeah, and you do see lots of those themes dropping into the, into this story, and indeed the previous one. I mean, mm. you know, you get the the governess characters will will pop up. He's usually very sympathetic towards governess characters. Yeah. You've got this at the end of of the adventures, in particular, with the Copper Beaches, mm. with the, with the governess character and the plot being suggested to Doyle by his mother Mary. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's a very 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 sort of family centric story. And then you're straight into the memoirs on the back of that. Yeah, and I think also mm. the that point about um, you know, him being more affluent. It reminds me a bit of uh, you know when the Beatles start to sing about the tax man, or Monty <laughs> Python starts to do sketches <laughs> about accountants. It's it's a bit of a sign that they <laughs> things are, things have improved for them a little mm. bit somewhat. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. Jay Z starts rapping about stock prices and things like that, <laughs> and all, all, all of his fans throw up their hands in disgust and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I mean, one of the things that is really interesting, I think, in in the memoirs, um, and I think this is different to the, the the collection we regard as the adventures, is that you get all this world building stuff that starts to happen. Um, so you get Holmes's past in the Glory Scott and Musgrave Ritual, and you obviously get Mycroft is introduced as well. What was behind that? Was Conan Doyle running dry? Was he trying to, <laughs> was he trying to spice this up some way? And why would he do it now when he's about to sort of fling his principal character off a, uh, off a waterfall? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's a good question. I think we're in the realm of uh, we're in the realm of sort of what I'd call educated speculation, which is always <laughs> the best kind of spe- <laughs> the best kind of uh, speculation. Uh, but yes, I think very clearly when you read. When you read his letters, and I think he has a very complete diary from this period as well, where he he notes down how much he's able to write, and so you can see when all the stories have been finished. Um, and he's very clearly relying on expanding the generic constraints of the early stories in order to allow himself to meet this target that he's given himself, which is twelve more stories. Um, it's in his mind, I think it's a, it, it, you can see it as a kind of devil's bargain or a bargain <laughs> with you know with his commercial, his sort of balancing his commercial and his artistic instincts. 
Herbert Greener Smith, who is the the literary editor of the Strand magazine, is is pressing him for more Sherlock Holmes stories. He's keen to end the adventures with the death of Sherlock Holmes, but his mother again uh, talks him out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he decides his 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 commitment to write twelve more stories was conditional on the idea that he would end the character at the end of them. Mm-hmm. And so he's got twelve stories to fill. In his mind, it's more of a commercial obligation than it is an aesthetic pleasure. You know, like when he's writing stories at one o'clock in the morning as a general practitioner in South Sea, that's real passion and motivation. Mm. And here what you're seeing is someone with an affluent lifestyle who needs to maintain it and assure his future uh, and all the rest of it. And so I think, yeah, you can definitely see that. I, I, I think it, similar things happen when long, continuous stories are being told, whether it's in soap operas or sitcoms. Yeah, yeah. And you need to pad it out and you need to uh, find... This is not to say there's not much to recommend those stories, mm. but I do think the integrity of them is, is compromised slightly um, by um, having stories where Watson only features at the beginning and which are recounted from... Holmes's youth. And then even the introduction of Mycroft. Mycroft, I think, has become a, a hugely popular character over time. But people were really upset about it. Yeah. Reading the original reviews, people were people thought this is a corruption of the stories. This is just a sort of he's a sort of Holmes replica. Um, and so this doesn't isn't adding much to the stories, which I was quite surprised about looking back yeah. at the original reactions. Mm. Yeah, I was really surprised mm. by that. I was really glad you brought that out because it hadn't really occurred to me mm. as well. I mean, there's almost that, in, to use the sort of modern parlance, it's almost like people complaining that the series had jumped the shark. Um, you know, that <laughs> that moment where you just go, has this become so self-referential, self, mm. self-indulgent that it's just... it's just jumped? The other thing, though, that struck me just rereading the, the memoirs before this was... Um, I hadn't really appreciated quite how much um, the, the sort of diminution of, of Watson takes place in two consecutive stories right in the middle mm. of the collection as well. So Gloria Scott and Musgrave Ritual, you both get him. And I just wondered if he might have been, it, it almost felt like he was getting a bit fed up with that narrative voice, but he doesn't entirely ditch that narrative voice. Mm. It's a very peculiar moment, I think, in the in the memoirs. Yeah, and I think this is one thing that you see when you're editing the stories, which I'm doing. So part of the editorial duties, the editorial labours of the editor, the scholarly editor, mm. is that you have to go through the stories and all the different versions of them and try and work out which is definitive, map all the different variations across the strand and the first edition and the second edition and the author's edition and all the mm. rest of it. But the quote marks become incredibly difficult to manage in something like the Musgrave ritual. <laughs> yes. Because mm. Watson is telling the story but he's got absolutely nothing to do with it. And so he's telling the story, but then instantly Holmes starts telling him a story. And then as part of his story, Reginald Musgrave will tell him a story. <laughs> and so I had to throw my hands up at one point and say, this is uh, the, the nested inverted commas <laughs> in this story are going to bring bring me to an early grave. But yeah, I think you can definitely see some of the, some of the contortions around that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and for all that, the Musgrave ritual is, uh, is, a, is a, I think it's one of the classic mm. uh, Holmes' stories, at, at, mm. least, at least in my view. Um, but yeah, even around the edges of that, although he's still capable of coming up with these very distinctive moments and images and characters, I do think you can see the um, he's running out of juice, you know. And uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, the introduction of subsidiary characters as being a sort of a symptom of jumping the shark, and I, I do think that's <laughs> definitely part of it. Mm. Like in Friends, when Reese Witherspoon pops up as Jennifer <laughs> yeah, Aniston, that's sister. right. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right. hi. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. But Person you, who will you, never appear again because she's too expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think you've, you've also, with with particularly with the Mycroft character, why people might have been upset by him is is he, he is in a way a, a diminution of, of of Holmes because Holmes admits he goes to Mycroft with problems to mm. solve. So you wonder how much is Holmes at work on this and how much is his brother? So it, it reduces that kind of omniscience that's been built up of Holmes and suddenly he's going to his big brother for help. Yes. So you know, that sort of thing will will really rile people, I would I would think. Well also in the story mm. he's uh, that's a good point uh, because in the story he just says, "Oh, actually, he's better than me. It's just that he's lazy." Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. if, yeah. if your USP as Sherlock Holmes is mm. just that you're slightly less intelligent than your brother, but don't mm. mind a bit of a walk. He also, he I think, because of his position, we we get this even more later in the Bruce Partington plans. But the fact that he's in the establishment also kind of reduces Holmes's outsider status. Because you know he's got an insider brother that he can he can turn to, and that again 
kind of just just takes something of that independence away from from homes and and just knocks things slightly askew mm-hmm. yeah definitely i think i mean uh, what i'm sometimes asked like what do you think like why is it that sherlock holmes maintains as a character maintains this this sort of um ridiculous amount of hold and pull with uh, across the mm-hmm. generations and across all the different media that the character is recycled through and i do think that one of the one of the only a real answers that I can give is that he's a believably bohemian outsider figure mm. with just enough allegiance to kind of middle class values and respectability in order to work in those interests. Um, but then, yes, as you say, I think it's very much my view that as soon as his brother runs the government, yes. uh, then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've, you've stepped over a line there. And the mm. uh, and the um, yeah, his brother doesn't bring him in on the naval treaty, of course. But the, the, the other thing is that you've got, uh, I think, Holmes's frailties on show here. I mean, it's always it's, there's always been a myth that Sherlock Holmes is con- kind of you know, a popular myth, not in people who've read the stories, but, you know, a popular myth that Sherlock Holmes is kind of um, can't, can't fail. But obviously in this first short story, that's exactly what happens. Um, but you do get a sense that there's a bit more of that kind of frailty on show here. And one of the po- things that you point out is that some of the stories in the in the memoirs might not be quite as tightly plotted as the earlier ones, and you cite there, you know, sort of the endings of the Greek interpreter, um, Musgrave ritual, and um, what happens to Rachel, and then also obviously uh, resident patient, where the sort of fates of the villains are not quite defined, as well. Yeah, so I've been I've been challenged on this, so I'll be, I'll be quite curious ah. to hear your guys' views on this. Because, um, this view was not uh, it wasn't expressed without pushback. Yeah, now, my, it was it was my it was my impression reading through the stories that there was there was a an increase in open endedness, <laughs> um, but open endedness that didn't marry up with the content of the story. So in my, in my view, reading the adventures stories, I mean, uh, some of the open endedness there would be sort of explained or would be sort of justified by the um by from within the story itself whereas mm. when you get mm. to the memoirs um to go through some of the examples um uh, in the musgrove ritual yes rachel howls yeah um she locks she about either she is responsible for abandoning her lover in, in the catacomb where he dies <laughs> uh, or she or it was an accident or she did it on purpose but then she just runs away throws the 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 crown of england into a lake and then just disappears completely yeah which seems seems to sort of admit uh, of a kind of frailty in Holmes that he wasn't able to find this uh, apparently mm. hysterical mm. young woman who sprints in the <laughs> middle of the night out of this this sort of aristocratic home. It seems beyond the wit of man, <laughs> let alone Sherlock Holmes. And then in the Naval Treaty, of course, uh, the whole the villain of the story um, is is a very dangerous man, and Holmes goes to enormous lengths to sort of collar him at personal risk in the middle of the night. And then he's just like, ah, it's probably better if we just let him go. Yeah, it's probably better that people don't know how incompetent our government is, and it goes back to that point. He's just working in service of this of this government, and uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it seems that again, it compromises the character, his commitment to justice. Uh, yeah, if he's just doing things that uh, oh, it's better that this story be kept out of the papers. Mm. What you're sort of describing there, in part, I think, is something that Niels Clausen talked about, which was that once the intellectual puzzle is over for Holmes. The kind of resolution of the story side of it, you know, the the sort of emotional resolution or the ethical, in that case, mm. the sort of moral resolution of it is less of a is less of a deal for him. It's kind of you know I've done the brain work, and and now I'm less less interested. But I think you know Gr- Greek interpreter famously, when going back to your <laughs> your your comment about um, the Granada series earlier, they had mm. to completely invent a new ending um, to give it more of a resolution to to mm. actually wrap it up properly. Mm. And if you remember in the Greek interpreter, the deus ex machina is that some guy who lives, I think it's in Croydon, just writes them a letter saying, oh, they're, they're, they live in such and such a house and here's yes. the address. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> mm. uh, and of course, they do place an advertisement at the start of the story, uh, which does, I, I suppose, lay the seed for that. But it's a very unsatisfying. <laughs> uh, uh, where where are they? Where is this woman mm. being held prisoner? The stakes, oh, there's this guy and he lives in some nondescript suburb of London. But uh, and he knows exactly what's going on. He's fully aware of the risk, but has done nothing. hasn't lifted a finger uh, <laughs> until he sees the advertisement. Which again, just again, you, you'd want the character to be, I suppose, a character. And I suppose I think reading through um, the whole story, maybe the repeated 
uh, theme of this conversation, I suppose, is taking us towards this idea that he's just not finishing the stories to quite as high a standard as he was with the mm-hmm. adventures. Mm-hmm. And the other example that I bring up is probably the Rygate Squires as an example of that, because, of course, the story is published as the Rygate Squire mm-hmm. in the Strand. But then people read the story and there's a degree of confusion about it. And so it's published in the first edition as the Rygate Squires, mm-hmm. plural, uh, which also doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. because... I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I suppose I would ask you the question. If mm-hmm. the story is called The Rygate Squires, who is the second squire in yes. the story? Yeah, mm-hmm. quite, absolutely. It, yeah, so he could forgot. be referring to, yeah, he, he could be referring to, to the neighbour, Alton, perhaps. Yeah, but yeah, but, um, mm-hmm. but then that's, uh, Alton barely, is barely in the story. So you see what mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah the every, every point, way there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of the... Uh, one of the but the the boring ah no it's not boring at all I'm being I'm being self deprecating I love it uh, one of the recondite issues that I get to resolve is who is the second mm. squire is it the mm. is it the father and the son but the son mm. wouldn't be called another the squire, squire. Mm, the young squire right. yeah so it must be Alton mm. yeah. but then Alton is barely in the story so it must have originally played a bigger role in how he planned the story mm. but then was marginalised mm. but never corrected yeah mm. yeah um the other the one that I find more problematic in the memoirs is uh, Stockbroker's Clark because I think it's the first is it the first example of recycling because it is the red-headed league just told in a different way I think it might be the first time he he sort of basically reused that plot and then of course that comes up again in three Garrett Ebbs and three Gables they're essentially the same the same basic premise told told again but I mean Paul you were looking at this as well I and mean, you you've often said that the plotting in some of the other stories yeah, I think I think we've got this right right from the very start, really, with with Scandal in Bohemia, uh, where that ends, it just tails off, and and the, the the king is stupid enough to say, well, she's promised that she won't show this photo to anyone, so her word is her bond, and uh, you know, there's no guarantee of that at all. Um, and then you've got other unsatisfying ones in the adventures, like the the, the five orange pips, where. Holmes allowed just just blithely allows his client to go off and get killed, and then the killers, <laughs> we assume, are on board this ship that's wrecked. Um, we, we, the, the engineer's thumb, the, the the villains in that just disappear after the house is burned down, yeah. um, and the barrel coronet, where where Sir George and and and. Uh, the um, the niece are just they they just wander off. We assume to a bad end, but we don't know. So it's 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 there all the way. And I I would I would argue this is kind of partly why we like Holmes as well is that he's not this kind of Poirot type figure who yeah. solves everything or is interested in tying up every loose end. I think it, it, it actually makes the stories more interesting. Uh, real life's like that. So why shouldn't these stories, you know, that kind of feeling come into it? Yeah, that's definitely true. And I mm. think if you look in debates, relatively recent debates about um, what in what's called short story studies, um, there's often a binary that's established between the, the, the well-plotted short story, which is you know written by a writer for the popular marketplace, and mm. the plotless short story, which is more the preserve of, you know, in the Henry James tradition, mm. in the yellow book, going on to mm. the English review, and really the, the sort of the fountainhead of, of the English modernist short story. Um, mm. But then, of course, I'm happy reading stuff like that, and I feel like I learn a lot. But then when I read the Sherlock Holmes stories, I feel like, I don't know, there is quite a lot of open-endedness. Mm. And I suppose mm. really it comes down to maybe I just like the adventure stories more, and maybe I actually can't quite. Because you ran through a, a litany there, Paul, which made me think, oh, my God, he's right. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense at all, but I still think those stories work better, and I can't quite, I can't quite say why. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you've you've obviously got freshness and verve to them as well, and I think, but I think mm. it's it, as much as this sounds. Maybe listeners will be thinking we're being really harsh on the memoirs, but <laughs> but actually, as much as it's it's about pointing out some of the some of the challenges with these stories, I think it's useful when you look at other collections like the Return. The Return gets hammered all the time. It still gets hammered to this day, and often for kind of plotting problems that are you you've you've identified here in the memoirs paul's just mentioned a few in in the adventures as well so it's something that is is kind of in the dna of them but we love them for it anyway Mm. i was going to ask about a question just move us on quickly to to one particular debate that you you really hone hone in on and and anybody familiar with the memoirs will know this one which is about the cardboard box Mm. and the fact that this story was was removed and then appeared in his last bow in 1917 by Conan Doyle, you know, at his at his request, and you have a really interesting discussion here about why you think um, the cardboard box was was moved. 
Yeah, so this is, I think everyone's had a crack at this. <laughs> uh, everyone who's interested in Sherlock Holmes, and uh, I think particularly people who have edited uh, the memoirs in the past, like Christopher Roden, who did the um, the Oxford World Classics a few years ago, mm. um, in the early 90s, I believe. Um, everyone has to sort of put the different pieces of the puzzle together uh, and to come up and kind of hypothesise what they think what they think happened. But for those who aren't familiar with the uh, the ins and outs of the debates, the cardboard box is the second story in the memoirs to appear. So Silver Blaze is published in The Strand in December 1892. And then the cardboard box is the second story. So it's, you know, a pretty significant, occupies a pretty prestigious place in that series in January 1893. Um, and it's published really without much comment as i was looking at the reviews and reactions people liked it it had a good reaction all right um people yeah. noted that it was a bit maybe a bit slightly more gruesome than <laughs> some of the others um but then by the time it came to the book edition the story is excised so the story is taken out of the, of the first book edition uh, at the end of 1893 and but not only is it taken out it's taken out in such a way as you feel like that would mean it was being suppressed because part of the story part of the opening of the story is taken and repurposed um, for the memoirs edition of The Resident Patient, mm. um, which has a, a slightly sort of insipid um, opening page or two. And so Conan Doyle, Conan Doyle really liked the opening of the cardboard box, which is the, the Holmes mind reading passage. The, where... the, the Poe stuff. <laughs> mm. Yes, exactly. The, the, the extraordinary brazen Poe ripoff. <laughs> 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 Which, in fact, is so brazen that it actually references, <laughs> references yes. the story. Mm-hmm. So you can't get too upset about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Conan Doyle repurposed that opening for the for the resident patient. So that seems like the story is just gone, because surely it couldn't be uh, used after that, having because you'd have to write a whole new beginning for it. Uh, but then in 1917, the story pops up again in the book edition of His Last Bow, uh, maybe to pad it out a little bit, but with its original version of it so in the Holmes canon there are two stories that have exactly the same mm. page and a half of uh, dialogue at the beginning which uh, is one of those infelicities that Conan Doyle was singularly unbothered by uh, but people like us uh, <laughs> break our heads against trying to work out how he could possibly have been okay with it mm. um, but the story of the cardboard box uh, is obviously contains certain plot details which I think is really the root of the problem or uh, that he wrote quickly he was um, assembling the plots um, pretty quickly and he was writing the prose pretty quickly as well and so the best read that I can come up with on the story which features um, a marriage that is blighted by the husband's alcoholism um, and a wife who as a result of that alcoholism is driven into the arms of a uh, young man um, who has an affair and the alcoholic father the alcoholic husband rather then kills both of them at the end mm. of the story um, they live in Liverpool and he follows them on a train on an outing to to New mm. Brighton and they go on a boating trip and he emerges through the mist and murders them both um, but the, the the wife who is murdered her name is Mary Conan mm-hmm. Doyle's mother's name was Mary Mary as we know was married to Charles Altamont Doyle uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's father who was an alcoholic um, and who we know uh, in his difficult, he was referred to at the time as a dipsomaniac, an mm. alcoholic. He would drink furniture polish. He would break open the children's uh, piggy banks to steal coppers in order to, to obtain alcohol. So this is a very traumatic component of mm. Conan Doyle's upbringing. And then you enter the man that we mentioned earlier, the sort of the spectral figure of Brian Charles <laughs> Waller, who was mm. the, the family lodger and who had some kind of relationship with Conan Doyle's mother. Um, which persisted throughout both of their lives and then um yeah so uh, it seemed to me that when you look at what kind of those public comments about the story first of all he said it was rather sensational in a later postcard that came out a few years ago he says it contained a quote sex element unquote mm. that i was uncomfortable with um but it seems to me the most likely outcome is that conan Doyle's mother Either Conan Doyle's mother mentioned to him that the story made her uncomfortable, mm. Mm. or Conan Doyle himself realised that the mixture of plot elements and biographical details could have been compromising to him or to his family. Mm. Mm. Um, so we, we don't have a strong evidence one way or the other, but the fact that it then reappears in 1917, uh, when his mother is very old by that point, um, and uh, in her last illness, doesn't seem to be accidental to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've I've written on this m- myself, Jonathan, and and I I essentially agree that this 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 is this is the core 
of 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 why this story was suppressed. The the idea where he comes up that the Conan Doyle says the story is more sensational than I would care for just just doesn't wash. When you look at some of the other stuff in the memoirs, yeah. you know the, the glorious Scott, the Musgrave ritual, the resident patient, these are all very sensational and violent stories themselves. Mm. It, 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 yeah. It's it's this kind of unconscious uh, revealing of, of 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 family history and and family concerns. I mean, he 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 did this. There was the um, a story he published in eighteen ninety one called A Sordid Affair which was yeah. essentially about his parents' difficult relationship. Uh, and the, the Surgeon of Gastafel, another short story, that's got elements of, of the family history. In. And, and again, interestingly, Sordid Affair didn't reappear until 1982. Uh, when Gastafel was reprinted, it, was, it had been subtly altered. Yeah. Uh, and he had a, a history and a habit of, of suppressing stories. He yeah. always wanted his, his, the, the mystery of Klumba to be suppressed, but that's on the, re, the grounds of it being quite a bad story. Um, <laughs> and, and the other one he was always very tetchy about was the parasite. Yeah. Um, the story yeah. of hypnotism and sex, which, which again, a lot of his, um, his inner feelings and inner turmoil obviously comes out in that story. Mm. And I, I think he just has these things published and then rereads them and goes, oh, God. Um, yes, I'd better, I'd better well, kind, kind of get rid of that one. <laughs> yeah, the the Beetle Hunter is the one that always amazes me because mm, that's the one mm. where there's a you know a young doctor is essentially tricked into into se- section you know signing the papers that will section somebody. And Conan Doyle was the person who was one of two doctors who signed the admissions of uh, well, it was to, to go from um, one institute his father to go from one institution to another essentially. Um, and that's sort of, you know, it's a it's a secret hidden in plain sight, as it were. But mm. uh, I think you've hit on 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 the nub of this reason, and particularly, I think the important bit in the puzzle has always been why does it reappear in 1917? Because you know, it could have reappeared in the Return, I suppose. Um, but actually, it's it's not until then that you you see it reappearing. Yeah, I have to say that's that that's given me a great deal of food for thought. Then about I hope these are going to be future episodes that you guys are going to do. <laughs> well, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, gastafel has <laughs> been on the list for a while. But, yeah. <laughs> um, and the other thing, the other thing I was just going to say, just to to the other main thing, of course, in this is going to be Holmes's Holmes's departure. One thing that you picked up in the in your introduction, which I thought was really interesting, I don't think I've read it before was this idea that maybe the references and the reviews were dwindling before you get quite to the end of the memoirs. And I just wonder if maybe, had the reading public sort of started to fall out of love with this? I mean, the publication figures would suggest maybe not, but the number of reviews, is there a little bit of, I don't know, tiredness breaking in and then suddenly you get this amazing story that essentially cements Sherlock Holmes in the popular imagination from then onwards yeah i think i was surprised as well because it wasn't i mean my my path to to discovering this was uh was pretty circuitous but i started off by you know as as you do like okay well let's have a look at the reviews of the memoirs when it came out Mm. and there were not many reviews of the book edition of the memoirs in early 1894 uh there are a couple of but various uh, not much to speak of. Most of the reviews just simply said, this is exactly what you think it is, and you'll already yeah. know if you'll like it or not. And so I started thinking, right, well, how can I map public reaction to some extent? Um, and fortunately, I, you know, I'm a, like, I've been trained in periodical studies, and I, I belong to a, a generation of scholars who can uh, log into databases and access, you know, the Whitstable <laughs> Times and the Sunderland <laughs> yes. Observer. Um, and I was thinking about this because I was having a look at Christopher Roden's edition of the memoirs of uh, Sherlock Holmes for the Oxford World Classics, which was really sort of the standard edition of the memoirs that mm. I was trying to sort of measure myself against. And it seemed just seems unfair that I'm able to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sit, sit in my pants with a packet of crisps and like log into <laughs> Gale newspaper vault and then just be able to dig all this stuff up. But nevertheless, uh, so you have a look around and actually what happens is a lot of these local newspapers reviewed every magazine every month not just the home stories, but the contents of the magazine more generally. Mm. Um, and so you were able to get a little bit of a kind of thermostatic gauge of how people were reacting to each story as it came out month by month. And the reaction is very, very strong in the first instance to uh, Silver Blaze and the cardboard box. Um, but by the time you get to the summer, and there's quite a number of reviews that cite the series of stories over the summer that run from uh, the Rygate Squire through the Crooked Man and the Resident Patient, um, as being 
week and you can definitely see it dropping down people's um, hierarchies mm. of the stuff they're looking for in the magazine. So one of the ways you can gauge it is by looking at the stories that people cite in the reviews. So yeah, people course. are much more interested in Charles J. Mansford's uh, short story sequence, uh, Shafts from an Eastern Quiver, which is a kind of like an adventure narrative cycle. Um, and that starts to be the first story that people mention. And then at the end might mention the home story, you know, up to his usual form or <laughs> something nondescript like that. And this does, as you say, Mark, I think, there is definitely something, there is definitely, I do not think that the Holmes phenomenon would exist in its current form and with its current scope if it hadn't been for the final problem and for the fact that the character was taken off the marketplace, Yeah, which created that kind of, the public wants it, but they can't have it. Mm. Um, yeah. And that insatiate desire is what really powers the, the, the character through the well, what people refer to as the great hiatus and then into the return and that economic appetite cultural appetite just grows and grows and grows yeah it's really interesting as well you 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 cite uh, i thought it was a great um comparison which is with um with hbo's game of thrones that <laughs> you know you, you suddenly at this point you get people this is this is the point at which this sort of fan base as we would call it now but the, the readership essentially have taken ownership of the character mm -hmm. and and um you know there is there is a lot of uh, there is outcry about the fact that you know doyle has done this there's a wonderful illustration you have in that chapter about um from today i think it was which is yeah um conan doyle and nunes next to the coffin with sherlock holmes in and and but one of the things that we picked up on when we covered the the final problem was that this is almost the origin of the the game in Sherlockian studies. That actually some of the newspaper letters that are written, sort of jokingly about the final problem, are are from Watson, <laughs> saying, "I can't believe that Conan Doyle has done this sort of thing." <laughs> it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a almost a postmodern moment. Mm. At the at the height of this, I just wonder if this has got something to do with why it <laughs> with with the longevity of of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, I think I think I mean the, the way you've summarised it there, Mark, I think is 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 quite right. I do think that um, there was a well, what was that? I think I cited another another review that said this is bad art and should be rewritten. Yeah, as in. Conan Doyle cannot be trusted to superintend this character. This character does not belong to him. This character belongs to his fans, exactly. to his yeah. readers. And you saw that the, the Game of Thrones thing, obviously, you saw the desire was not just, oh, oh let, this is bad and uh, the creators have sold us out. It was, this needs to be redone. Yeah, remade. Yeah, that's right. The entire season eight of Game of Thrones must be re-scripted and re-shot and it must be at least 15 episodes each an hour long in order to give do the story justice <laughs> um and that sort of that sort of fan tantrum um <laughs> yeah is de definitely got its seeds in this period where you're seeing you know i mean literary fandoms have always been around uh i think i cite the example of the sorrows of young werther um mm -hmm. and uh Pamela. I mean, liter literary merchandise and fandom has always been a thing, but it certainly reaches uh, a new and vertiginous high in the 1890s <laughs> where people have been surrounded by uh, the whole literary marketplace has professionalised and commercialised and advertising has become much more intrusive, much more a part of everyday life. And I do think that, yeah, that, that, it, that is the cradle of the modern Sherlockian fandom in that moment and had he just carried on or not not killed the character just said oh, i'll do more when i get round to it i do think that there would have been less fervor less passion and less of a bedrock of um yeah fervor i suppose to, yeah. to power that phenomenon yeah yeah you, what, what what do you think is is, is really going on here is, is this because conan doyle is also a controlling personality is is this him taking control and asserting his own view of his own work and he is in command not the fans yeah definitely i think one of the things that might be interesting to to, mm. to sort of contextualize what you're saying there paul is the um his attitude when he does his author's edition of his works mm. because that's a, a big it's a big collection of bound volumes and he mm. gets to decide what counts and what doesn't what makes the mm. cut and what doesn't um and he spends a great deal of time writing the introductions to all of the historical novels um, and providing fresh footnotes and all the rest of it. And then the home stories are kind of thrown in together <laughs> uh, amongst, <laughs> amongst other things. And mm. so very clearly in his own mind, like his great contribution was going to be this. Um, mm. There's a sort of re overview of his career in uh, published in a, an English magazine, which says, I'm going to, I might paraphrase it. It says, 
Um, Conan Doyle had potential, but Sherlock Holmes tempted him and he <laughs> fell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that attitude, I think, really does speak to his deepest anxiety about his own about his own writing. Mm. So if you look at he has an aesthetic criteria which values the historical novel above all things, but which also values other things as well, like mm. um, domestic fiction. I mean, mm. he, he very yeah. much appreciates Wells. He stands up for George Moore's um, novel, Esther Waters. Mm. And so he's someone who feels that English fiction could definitely be pushing the boundaries a bit more. Mm. Um, in his diaries, he remembers going to going to the theatre to see the adaptation of Emile Zola's Therese Racine, which, mm. uh, for those, <laughs> of, those who haven't read it, features all sorts of horrors, including a cat being murdered by throw, being thrown against a wall and all the rest of it you know the typical sort of zola <laughs> typical zola scene so he he himself he had some avant-garde tendencies um and he had quite a i think quite an ornate aesthetic hierarchy in his mind of yeah. the kinds of fiction and he mm. imagined himself moving seamlessly across all these different genres and you can see that in the domestic fiction that he writes like you know a duet and an occasional chorus and mm. the medical fictions which roger luckhurst is is editing for for mm. our series as well um but so definitely, the, but definitely, historical fiction was at the height of that, um, and popular fiction, genre fiction, particularly short stories, very much towards the towards the bottom. Mm. Um, and so his aesthetic criteria is completely out of whack with the commercial criteria yeah. of his career. So the things that will earn him the most money are the things that will earn him the least amount of credibility. Mm. It's interesting looking back, I suppose, just as a modern reader, because um, when I read something like Sir Nigel. Like it has it certainly has some qualities to recommend it. Like it's not I don't, mm. it's not bad, I wouldn't mm. say. Mm. But the idea that that would be what lasted through the decades is sort of slightly comic. I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> that he's sitting there. I remember I, I got about halfway through Sir Nigel for uh, when I was writing my my book a few years ago, and and it said finally their adventure was ready to begin. <laughs> <laughs> my God, mm. yes. two hundred and eighty pages in, yes. Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. But he he also then manages later on to combine the two to perfection in the Brigadier Gerard series, mm. Mm. where you've, oh, yeah. you've got that ease of writing of the Holmes type stories, but the historical research, but worn lightly. Yeah, worn lightly. And, and the, you know, this is why, you know, as, as Owen Dudley Edwards says, you know, this 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 is this is his best historical fiction, and yeah. he really if he he'd, if he'd you know seen that. A bit more, and and maybe done some more historical work in different periods, but use that format. We'd we'd probably have ended up with some more successful stories. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, that actually come that actually mm. comes back to something you you mentioned, Jonathan, in in your introduction as well, which is that Conan John might come to resent to some extent mm. the fact that he's having to put a bit more work into the plots now. He's having to maybe search around to try and find new ideas to include. It's become a bit more workman like there's a bit less kind of um natural verve to 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 that writing and again i think the the place where you get that natural verve and that sort of unselfconscious writing in its best example is probably the gerard stuff actually mm. um mm. you know where the, the you know there's no expectations and yet he can just he can just enjoy it maybe mm. in the same way as he did perhaps with the first six sherlock holmes i don't know mm. Yeah, and I think the research there is worn very lightly, as as one of you said just now. Yeah, definitely. I think because he makes a big deal out of in his prefaces for the historical fiction how many books he's read. Yes. And when he's interviewed in the press, he's always saying, "Oh, I read 150 books about <laughs> yes. the Battle of Crecy." <laughs> and uh, yes, I think it's the temptation of I think maybe uh, maybe even the reader at the time, but certainly the modern reader to sort of shrug their shoulders a bit and say, "Well, maybe we don't care about all the different types of bow." Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, quite right. Well, Jonathan, it's been fantastic to have you on. Thank you so much for your time. And um, it's been it's been a delight to talk through the memoirs. Um, and uh, best of luck with the book. What are you working on um, next? Oh, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. I've, as a fan of the podcast, this is a, it's been a real pleasure for me. Uh, so I really appreciate you guys, your, your guys work and, uh, and uh, inviting me on. Um, what I'm working on now, uh, well, I'm going to do uh, his, I'm going to do uh, the casebook of Sherlock Holmes for the Edinburgh editions, mm. but I've, I've got myself a couple of years where I'm writing a book about uh, the relationship between fiction and silent cinema in the early oh, wonderful. Yeah, mm. 20th century. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, really interesting. So that would be great. That's we'll look what's germinating at present. <laughs> oh, we look forward to that as well. That's yeah. brilliant. So, well, thank you very much for your time, Jonathan. And, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we look forward to catching up with you again in the future. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. Well, that was that was great to uh, to speak to Jonathan there about mm. the the memoirs. Very enjoyable, great fun, very very interesting. Um, a lot of stuff we've been digging about in there, um, and and much for yeah you know, that, that we we'll often look look for the failings. We 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 must <laughs> point out as well that we do love the memoirs. You know, yeah. they, they, it's it's a wonderful collection um, yeah. and and just 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 great fun but it's the it's finding these uh, these uh, these anomalies and and the, the the oddities of the story that actually makes them richer makes them better absolutely um so it, it's 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 definitely not a a, a criticism overall. Yeah. definitely not absolutely 100 percent agree hmm. so that's all we've got time for this episode uh, thanks very much for listening you can find the show notes at doingsofdoyle.com and if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast there's details of how you can sponsor us through paypal or patreon at the website as well um so paul what are we doing on the podcast next time well at the end of the discussion with jonathan there we talked about brigadier gerard um and we're actually going to look at one of the gerard stories in detail with the the next episode the brigadier in england uh a highly amusing story full of cultural misunderstanding yeah good stuff great (laughs) so we will see you for the next one until then it's goodbye from me and goodbye from me Goodbye. Come in, Sherlock. Come in, sir. You don't expect such energy from me, do you, Sherlock? Hmm? Now, how did you get here?